Welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to look at one of the most fascinating periods in Chinese history, where the collection of warring kingdoms coalesces into the first major empire in Chinese history. In a period that's often referred to as the Warring States period, sort of the end of the Shang Dynasty, is a sort of collection of kingdoms that have been vying for supremacy. This is a period of dissolution. This is a period of lots of conflict between kings. And Confucius is a, a very important scholar at this time who brings about a new philosophy, sort of thinking about time, how we can make uh, the kingdom better. I'll talk more about Confucius later, but it's important to recognize that during this time of foment and confusion, there was actually a tremendous amount of new ideas and new exploration that was happening and new technologies developing. Of course, during the Warring States period, a great deal of time uh, and attention was paid to developing an extremely high caliber of military weapons. One of the common weapons at this time was this halberd called a gi. Now the halberd was especially effective against uh, horse uh, riders and it was meant that it could be used to sort of knock a horseman off, uh, decapitate a horseman from a person standing on the ground. This angle of this blade and the length of this blade were studied very carefully and then through these numerous battles the pitch of the blade and the length of the blade were slowly adjusted until they found this sort of perfect uh, functionality and this is part of what makes this period very interesting is that there's a sort of resurgence of interest in practicality and functionality and a very close attention to uh, product liability, making sure everything that came out was the best possible thing. And there's a sort of return to this idea of precision and control. We can see this in the transformation that takes place in the metallurgy around the bronze casting that was used in earlier periods as religious vessels for honoring the ancestors. We see on the left here um, a late Shang Dynasty bronze vase with all kinds of additions and elaborate ornamentation and it just looks kind of absurdly over the top. During this Warring States period a uh, new, much more simpler, elegant, refined, functional shape with a much richer and more complex surface uh, design was given to the bronze casting. Now they're inlaid with silver, so it has this sort of composite metals. This is really technically incredibly complicated and uh, just an amazing sense of function and purpose and elegance kind of all put together. We also see uh, a kind of growth in uh, mythological ideas and uh, kind of fascination with the spirit world, uh, such as this uh, we call a multivalent zoomorphism, which is a mixture of a stag, a horse, and a bird of prey. Uh, the meaning of this creature is lost to us over time. We can see how this sort of amalgam of animals and these swirling lines give a feeling that this is somehow a kind of supernatural being, and sort of uh, a trans a creature that is and represents sort of the force of the animal spirit. Animal spirits also begin to appear elsewhere in one is considered one of the earliest depictions of a human being in a painting. We have a woman painted with a dragon and a phoenix. Both mythological creatures would become very important in the ideology and philosophies of China. 
We have at this time also discovered some extraordinary archaeological finds that are just really amazed scholars at the breadth and the extraordinary wealth and cultural depth of this period. One of the most extraordinary tombs is the Marquis Yi tomb, which contained this vast array of musical instruments, bronze vessels, a huge variety of weapons, uh, leather armor, lacquerware, uh, which is you know, incredibly time-consuming, highly crafted objects, bamboo articles, which would be books on philosophy and law, gold and jade stone objects. So we have this amazing amount of wealth as combined. And the Marquis of Yi was not you know, the most highest status person. It just happens to be a tomb that has survived down to the present day where we can really examine it intact, what these tombs might have contained. So it demonstrates an incredible cultural richness and an amazing technological achievement. Let's look at some of the musical instruments that have been uncovered in this tomb of these very unique and remarkable stone chimes, individual stones that have been sort of cut and shaped so that it could be struck like gongs to create a kind of uh, musical score. And the tuning of these, depending on the kind of stone and the size and shape of the stone, created this really remarkable and unique sound. Probably the most spectacular musical instrument in the Marquis of Yi's tomb is the set of 65 bian song, or uh, bronze bells. There's actually a video uh, link in this week's lecture to hear people who have reconstructed the music on these instruments, and you can get a sense of what they sound like. These bells are very interesting. They are extremely complex in their casting, and they don't produce a single tune, but they are actually have two different sounds each bell can make, depending on whether you strike it on the flat side or on the sort of narrower um, shape of the side of the bell. Here you see a close-up with all this intricate metalwork and design showing the incredibly elaborate care and craftsmanship that went into this. We know from the philosophy of Confucius and other scholars in, in, at the time that music was a very important idea that was giving this idea of, of stability, that music promoted a sense of uh, harmony, uh, social harmony and social goodwill. And so by playing music, it was sort of to elevate people and remind them of their social obligations and their uh, correct actions. The Warring State period eventually coalesces into the Qin Dynasty under the leadership of this megalomaniacal leader, Qin Shi Huangdi, who brought together his absolute legalist doctrines where everything had to be followed to the letter. He dictated all these laws and orders so that everybody would do as exactly as they were told. Here we see some of the earliest coin money that was minted from this time. Uh, Chinese coin money has a very distinctive shape to it. It is a, a round coin with a square hole in it, sort of reminiscent of our earlier B discs that we saw that represented the circle, the idea of heavens and fertility, and the square in the center, the square hole is also this idea of earth. And so within that idea of earth and sky, this idea of the sort of abundance and wealth and prosperity are contained within the coin. During the period of the Qin dynasty, a number of really ambitious projects were undertaken. And this has become the kind of hallmark of a dynasty, which is to engage in these sort of massive projects 
uh, that sort of unify the country and demonstrate the incredible power of the emperor. One of the most dramatic that most of these early projects was the Great Wall of China that uh, he unified ac across the northern territories. And another was this highway system that uh, spread outward from his central kingdom in Xinjiang. And from there, he was able to kind of lead his soldiers out in any direction to suppress any rebellions as needed. You see so how the, the highways sort of fan out from that one center. The road designs in the Qin Dynasty are really remarkable, and some evidence of them persists down to the present day. You can see in this uh, Qin Dynasty road in Hebei province, there is a pair of grooves that have been dug deeply into the ground. The grooves are meant so that the chariots would sort of fit inside the groove and they could ride quickly along the road because all of his vehicles had the exact same axle lengths. This meant that his vehicles could move along his highways and anyone else from any other kingdom that didn't make their axles the precise width, they would not be able to use his roads. As I mentioned before, uh, the Great Wall of China gets its origins from this time. Of course, we see below here how it looks today, this massive fortification. Uh, much of what that uh, comes from much later dynasties, such as the Ming and the Qing dynasty. But in reality, its origins were just as kind of earthen mound, a kind of uh, bulwark or with some um, signal towers and garrisons along the frontier. The idea was to define and defend against the invading barbarians, as they called them, the, nor the northwestern cultures of the Mongols from the interior the, of Siberia and then that region. The wall also had played a very important role in Qin Chi Wang Di's term as a way of kind of defining what is China. He could argue that anyone south of the wall was in fact a part of their territory and that they could tax them. So the wall uh, was a very you know, important political symbol uh, that defined China and its northernmost extreme. And it became a kind of symbol of its power and its prestige and its ability to regulate the people on the other side of the wall, the people who are contained within the boundary of China, of the Qin Empire. So the Great Wall of China, as we, as we see now, has much been maligned as part of a legacy of oppression that uh, has really never been celebrated in its, by the common people. Uh, it has been given the name the Great Wall of Tears uh, for the extraordinary human cost in building and maintaining this edifice. Um, it is a part, only a small part of the wall remains uh, intact and uh, visible to tourists today. Much of its several thousand mile uh, length has fallen into dissolution and uh, ruin. The Terracotta Army is one of the most significant accomplishments that we have uncovered of the Qin Dynasty that has come down to us. It is the world's largest archeological dig site. It is absolutely phenomenal. The scale and magnitude and complexity of this tomb that no one was ever intended to see. This was going to be the burial mound that honored the late Qin Shi Huangdi. And he began building and working on this before he died. It became very early on a kind of massive, massive project that involved thousands and thousands of workers to build 
this huge underground tomb. The tomb itself contains estimated eight, seven to 8,000 soldiers. Only about a 1,000 or so of the soldiers in the tomb have been uncovered. They were all badly damaged uh, when the tomb was raided uh, after the fall of the Qin dynasty and the, the ceiling collapsed down on top of them. And a very large team of archaeologists have been at work ever since the 1980s to slowly piece together and assemble this massive army. As you can see here uh, from the photograph, this vast hangar now encloses uh, where this pit where all the soldiers were buried and where they're starting to assemble the ranks and is, is a full-scale, life-size replica of the actual army of Qin Shi Huangdi. Here you can see uh, this incredible tomb that I just showed you, which is called Pit One, which is the largest of the four pits that have been discovered in the late 1970s. And uh, subsequent digs and discoveries have sort of unearthed this massive, what's called a necropolis, a kind of tombs and uh, cities and, and temples. Qin Shi Huang's Di's tomb uh, is still yet to be uncovered, this massive pyramid. They are slowly examining the site uh, using... Uh, without actually digging into it. They're trying to do uh, imaging from radar and, and deep imaging into the ground to try and get a sense of what's in there. And they're hoping that when they have the idea of what they're going into, they can excavate it. Legend has that Qin Shi Huangdi's tomb is full of extraordinary marvels and wealth. And no one is quite sure what they will find when they do uncover it. Let's talk now about the soldiers in the Terracotta Army that populate this. Uh, you can see here a general in the army, uh, and uh, by comparison in the center of the picture, I have put uh, sort of normal human proportions so that you can notice how the upper body of the general has been given a kind of extended proportion and the shorter lower part of the body giving them sort of towering stature, making them sort of stand out. This stylization is very interesting in comparison to the ordinary soldiers that make up the army whose proportions are much more naturalistic. This is the thing that's also very remarkable, the incredible naturalism. All of the faces of all of the soldiers in the entire army are unique. They're sculpted with an incredible precision and human uh, details in their clothing, their dress, their armor. And this is incredible when you think about the thousands of soldiers that make up this army, that there's this incredible diversity uh, representing different ethnic groups and different people. And it may have, in fact, been actual portraits of actual soldiers in this army. We can see the way they built this army was through a series of sort of molded pieces that were assembled in a kind of assembly line factory like, you know, Henry Ford's idea of building the Model T. They were doing that 2,000 years ago, way back in China. They were kind of going in with these teams of artisans, with specialists who would focus on the details, and workers who would assemble these in this massive way, and then put them together and build them up and then fire them. So you can imagine just the amount of the size of the kilns uh, and the way in which they were able to put this all together to create this uh, incredibly realistic portrait of his actual army. Here I had a chance to see uh, some of these soldiers up close. On two different occasions, there was an exhibition I went to in Honolulu and then uh, more recently in Chicago, there uh, were a number of soldiers on display at the Field Museum. If you ever have the chance to see these, 
uh, amazing soldiers. I highly recommend it. It is just incredible. It's like looking at a portrait from the past, from a civilization 2,000 years ago. The soldiers are slightly larger than life size. So the, pe the figures here are represented are about six feet tall, and they have this imposing um, stature about them, this amazing realistic hairdo uh, and uh, stylization. Notice in these two faces here the differences between something as simple as the ears. There was uh, about 18 different varieties of ear that were sculpted into the heads and beards and mustaches and special hair styling was all given to the, the incredible variety soldiers. I also want to point out a couple other important facts about these soldiers. Um, here is a general um, a model of what they probably looked like when they were first created. The general on the right here has been painted um, and this is something that they've begun to discover as they've been unearthing these. They found uh, techniques of using chemicals to re-adhere some of the original paint on the soldiers. And they're getting a better idea now of what these soldiers wore in their clothing. And what's so incredible about that is that you imagine not just were these fired and assembled, but each one of them was painted with this amazing realistic detail. The other soldier I want to point out here is a soldier with no armor or no weapons. Now, sometimes these are referred to as archers, but there is not found anything that would, would suggest that they actually had bows or arrows or anything like a quiver of any kind. And so another theory is that these soldiers were specialists in martial arts. You can tell by the way they stand. You notice how that one foot comes forward uh, in, in a sort of T fashion. This is a sort of classic martial arts pose that this figure is standing in. And these soldiers, it is believed, were a special part of a, an elite corps who would charge into the enemy's ranks and use the enemy's own weapons against themselves. Another note about the coloration. There's an incredible array of colors in the soldiers. They are painted in ways that suggest they were brightly colored and meant to be fierce and terrifying and sort of look large and imposing by having these sort of splashes of extraordinary color all over them. These colors are also remarkable because many of them include brilliant blues and purples. Colors that are not natural colors, such as natural dyes that you might find on uh, in trees or barks or organic products. But these are colors that have been built and made chemically. Now, chemical-based colors is an extremely sophisticated science that uh, it is remarkable at this time. We have evidence of this, um, what's known later as Han Purple from the Han Dynasty. But here we see it now in the Qin Dynasty prior to this. This Han Purple um, has a sort of extremely sophisticated synthetic color that would put under extreme cold and high magnetic field, the material enters into a new state called the quantum critical point in which three dimensions collapse into two. Now, I can't explain it any better than that, so bear with me. This is a material of that is a refined synthetic color that has extraordinary properties when heated and cooled it. Not that it was ever used for those purposes during its origins, its creation, but they're finding that its chemical properties are really quite extraordinary. We also see in the army uh, horses, chariots, all of the soldiers had actual armaments, had actual bronze weapons, and we have these incredibly complex crossbows. Uh, they had invented the crossbow uh, with these bronze fittings long before anyone else in Europe. 
We also have another pit which shows uh, figures that are part of a troupe of actors and entertainers. And this is sort of this giant figure of an acrobat that may have been the base of a human pyramid. And so the temple was meant as a way of creating a kind of copy of all the things that Qin Shi Huangdi enjoyed during his lifetime. Now, the purpose of this tomb is not fully known, but the idea that has developed over time is that Qin Shi Huangdi created this tomb as a way of, one, encouraging this idea that he was a grand and powerful emperor in the afterlife, but also it was a shift away from Shang Dynasty pro projects in the past. In funerals in the past, soldiers and servants might be killed uh, to follow the emperor into the next life. And it, this new idea of creating a ceramic model of the soldier instead of killing an actual soldier was a way of kind of reassuring the soldier that their, their sacrifice in this life would not require them to make a sacrifice in the next life. And that's why so much time and attention was put to this magnificent tomb that no one would ever see. The Qin dynasty was an extraordinarily brief dynasty. The brutality of Qin Shi Huangdi uh, followed by a, an incredible uh, series of natural disasters which made the people believe he had lost the mandate of heaven. There was no stability, there was no order, chaos had reigned. And as, led, as the rumors of the emperor's death began to spread, then the peasants rose up and they had lost the, quote, mandate of heaven, Tianming. The mandate of heaven means that the emperor has the right to rule and rule absolutely as the one person who has that closest link to the gods and who is going to be the fulcrum point of all the blessings from the ancestors and gods down to all of his people. And he has this very key role and it is mostly win. OK, there are very few exceptions to this. And the emperor is going to have this um, unique role until there is a loss of prosperity, a loss of uh, wealth and stability. And at that point, it is considered the responsibility of the people to overthrow the emperor and establish a new dynasty. It has the mandate of heaven. And so we see in Chinese history these dynasties that last for decades, but more often about 200, 250 years, and then they fall into disillusion and are sort of remade and reborn. The Han dynasty that followed after the Qin dynasty took as its example, as a kind of the Qin dynasty, as a negative example. The Han dynasty was very critical of uh, the extreme attitudes of legalism in the courts of, of Qin Shi Huangdi and began to promote a more humanistic ideas about stability and the order than they took on uh, new projects with greater concern for the, uh, the people that they were ruling over. Here we see a soldier from the Qin tomb. And what's interesting is if we compare this practice of creating ceramic figures, that would continue on in the Han Dynasty. There was not so many soldiers made they instead began to include domestic servants. But there was a sort of rejection of this sort of life-size, realistic uh, tomb sculptures that were so prevalent in Qin Shi Huangdi's tomb. Instead, much smaller, uh, more stylized 
uh, less human looking figures began to appear in the tombs, more childlike. And then later on, a complete movement away from figures at all, and again, just showing the examples of wealth, like a model of a farm or the clay uh, house or tower, which represented a person who was landed gentry. So all of these things began to change as people considered the Qin dynasty sort of the negative example that they had to reject in order to promote stability and peace in their kingdom. Here's our review quiz. Question one, how did the tomb art in the Warring States period differ from the Shang dynasty? Question two, what changes did the Qin dynasty bring to China? Question three, what stylistic qualities can be found in the terracotta army? Question four, what is Tianming, and how did it influence the fall of the Qin dynasty? Question five, how did tomb art change after the Qin dynasty?